All right, good morning. I'm gonna try the first of my online lectures. We'll see how they go. I'm calling this Cardio One. Mostly I'm gonna scribble on my lovely whiteboard here, as usual, funny stick pictures, that sort of thing. And then I'll try and use the antique overhead projector, put some pictures up. They won't look great. Uh, resolution isn't good, they're a little glary, but you know, when I edit this thing, I'll try and put a, a reference up here to the slide number on the PowerPoint that's already posted on Blackboard, so you'll be able to get it there. Now, the, I got three sections, and they're all slightly different spots, so some of this might be a little bit of sort of rehash for, I think, at least one of the sections. Uh, but that'll get you all at the same speed anyway, and so then we can go from there. All right, first, we've noticed you know, the heart's in the middle of the chest, that area called the mediastinum, basically between the lungs, sternum, and the vertebral column. That's where you find the heart, along with some other structures. Uh, I think we also went through the layers of the heart in all three sections. So the outer layer, the parietal pericardium, which has that tough, you know, fibrous connective tissue outer layer and then a serous inner layer. That's to prevent the heart from overfilling, from overstretching. So you don't go to that downward portion of that length tension curve. So basically the more you fill it up to a point, the greater the force of contraction. That is the more we pump, more in, more out. Basically Starling's law of the heart. Uh, so we did the parietal pericardium, then you have the pericardial cavity, which is just filled with serous fluid. That's the lubricant that allows the heart to slide around in there without generating a lot of friction and inflammation, that sort of thing. Then you had the visceral pericardium or epicardium, the serous layer just attached to the surface of the heart. When you remove that, most of the heart's volume is the myocardium. We went over some of the similarities and differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle. Review that, you know, those are good little quiz questions in there. And then the inner lining is the endocardium, which covers the inner chambers and lines all the valves and that sort of thing. Now what we're going to do is just kind of go through the piece of the heart, kind of name some of the valves, the direction of blood flow, when valves are opening, when valves are closing. Real quick, one of the ugly pictures, because I'm not going to use it much, but again, I'll reference the slide number from the PowerPoint up here. You've got one similar to this, but this is a you know, diagrammatic representation of the heart, uh, the right atria and the right ventricle, left atria, left ventricle, septum here. And you know, that's a decent diagram for the heart. The problem is it's, it's three-dimensional. It's kind of a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional heart, and it's kind of hard to see what's going on. So we'll come back to this, but for now what we're gonna do, imagine if you took like a really sharp razor blade and you cut this thing through the interventricular septum there between the right and the left ventricle, and through the interatrial septum, kind of through here, you could actually cut the heart into two pumps because our heart, a mammalian heart, is in fact two pumps. We have a right heart and we have a left heart. They happen to develop in the same area, so they're in the same spot, but mechanically you could have one here, one here, we'll do the same thing. So what I'm gonna do is go over one side of the heart at a time, just kind of list the structures inside it, how the blood flows through it. We'll start with the right side of the heart. I'll kind of go through its parts, and then later we'll go through the left side of the heart. So already, here's my diagram of the heart. It's a little simpler than that one. I will draw a small rectangular box that's going to represent the right atrium, and this will be the right ventricle. So this is the right side. I'll do R atria, and this is the right, I'll just abbreviate ventricle. All right, so this is a pump, and remember, a pump by itself doesn't do much. You have to have some plumbing. So there's some, you know, inlet and exhaust pipes, so to speak, the blood vessels bringing blood to and from the heart so the heart can pressurize it, do the work to move the blood through the system. If this is the right side of the heart, you should already know, because we had a lot practical. Coming into the right side of the heart would be, I'm going to abbreviate them a little bit, but imagine these are the two veins bringing blood into the heart. And again, by definition, the veins are return tubes. They're going to be bringing blood back to the heart, sort of at the end of the system, so they're always quite low pressure. But on the right side, these would be the the superior and inferior vena cava. So those are the ones that bring blood back, inferior from the abdomen and legs, superior from the brain, head, arm, that sort of thing. I've kind of merged them into one here, and I'll go into the right atrium. Now, we've already mentioned the heart is a pulse pump. You know, it doesn't continuously push out blood. It's kind of like a, a Dixie cup made of muscle. It just sits there under the faucet, and it passively fills. Well, when it's passively filling, again, the, car, the heart has a cycle, a cardiac cycle, they sometimes call it. When the heart is resting or filling, the term, again, is
diastole. In the heart, you know, think of diastole, that equals rest, which also is equivalent to filling. So this is an important sort of part of the cardiac cycle. I mean, the heart isn't doing anything, but you have to have the filling or it wouldn't be able to pump anything. So we'll watch this right side of the heart during diastole when it's doing nothing. Now, there is some pressure in the vena cava. It's not a lot, uh, but it's, you know, a few millimeters of mercury. You know, say about two millimeters of mercury pressure. Again, the units for pressure we'll use throughout the circulatory respiratory systems are millimeters of mercury. It's just the amount of force necessary to raise a column of mercury that high. The pressure in the atrial ventricle is much lower, so that blood is going to passively move into the atria, just like a little hollow bag on the top of the heart. The atria will fill up fairly quickly with blood, and then, as we've seen in lab, there is a big opening between the right atria and the right ventricle. So we're sticking our fingers through so you can tell which atria it was, that sort of thing. This opening is called the atrioventricular orifice, and because it's open and it's big, the blood will passively move from the atria, you know, once it's filled up in here, the blood will move into the ventricles, and basically the ventricles will fill up to 80% of their capacity during diastole. Now the ventricles are the important ones, because the ventricles are the main pumps. I think I've mentioned before, if your atria quit working, it wouldn't kill you. You know, you'd lose a little bit of your cardiac output but it's, it's not lethal. They're sort of just uh, priming pumps, as we'll see in a bit. So the ventricles are the main ones. That's kind of why we emphasize what's going on with the ventricles. They quit, your toes. So we've got 80% passive filling. The heart's just sitting there, blood flows passively into the atrium, into the ventricles, fills it up to about 80%. So that's most of your filling is passive. It's during diastole. Then the heart will begin to contract. Now, recall, contraction, We call systole. So in the heart, the cardiac muscle fibers are actually generating some force. They're contracting. We'll call it systole. So systole is equivalent to contraction. Now, I know I mentioned before all uh, cardiac muscle cells are connected with the gap junctions, right? So the impulse will move from cell to cell. So I think I mentioned all the cardiac muscle cells will contract with the same frequency, but they don't all contract at the same time. That impulse, that action potential moving through the gap junctions, cell to cell, doesn't happen instantaneously, it takes time. So if you can watch a heart when it's actually contracting, what you notice moving first are the atria. Atrial systole will begin before ventricular systole. As we'll see when we start looking at the electrical activity of the heart, there's a delay of about 16 hundredths of a second, 0.16 seconds from when the atria begin to contract until you see contraction in the ventricles. So atria will contract first. Now all they do, remember, Cardiac muscle is striated, but the fibers are running around this, you know, Dixie cup-like chamber. It's hollow. It's full of blood. When the, when the skeletal muscle or the cardiac muscle fibers start to contract, they'll squeeze on the, on the blood in the atria. They actually get smaller. The volume gets smaller, so the muscle cells contract. It'll squeeze on the blood, and what that does, that will fill up the ventricles to about 100% of their capacity during atrial systole. So as the atrial contract, all they're doing, they're squeezing that last 20% of blood down in the ventricles. That's why I say if your atrial quit working, it wouldn't kill you. Remember, normal, normal cardiac output's like five liters per minute. A human has the capacity to go up to about 40 liters per minute. So there's a lot of what they call cardiac reserve. You can pump way more blood than you need at rest. So if the atria didn't do this last job here, this topping off the ventricles, they'd still be 80% full. You might lose 20% of your heart's pumping ability, but you got enough reserve. You could compensate for that. It wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be lethal. So the atria contract, and they're going to fill up the ventricles to 100% of their capacity. Oh, I can get my eraser. My whiteboard doesn't work well. I kind of have to paint it after about three runs. But anyway, atria contracts, squeeze the, squeeze the blood down in the ventricles, fill them up to capacity, 
Then the ventricles are going to begin to contract. Now, you've seen the ventricles in lab, and those cow hearts are like an inch and a quarter thick. They're massive, huge, huge amount of muscle. They squeeze on that blood very quickly. This pressure is going to go way up. Now, what we don't want to happen, again, blood, like most fluids, will follow, you could say, a path of least resistance. There's this big hunk and hole here the blood just came through. So when the ventricles contract, that blood is going to have a tendency to go right back the way it came. That is, go up in the atria, back into the ventricles, then back in the atria, then the ventricles, then the atria. It's just oscillating. It's not going anywhere. You keel over dead. So what you'll find in the circulatory system, there are a number of one-way valves. These valves allow blood to move in one direction, but if it tries to go backwards, they close. There are four of these valves in the heart. We've already looked at them in lab. There is one located between the right atrium, right ventricle. That's this one right here. These two little lines here represent the cusps of this valve. The one on the right side, it is called You could call it the tricuspid valve or the right atrioventricular valve, either one will do. Now again, these valves are passive. Think of them as kind of like a door that's hinged right here at the edge here and just projects down into the stream here. As long as blood is moving from the atria into the ventricles, it's going to keep those little flaps pushed open, just like wind blowing into a door or something. It'll keep it pushed open. But as soon as the ventricles contract and the pressure gets really high here and the blood's going to try and go this way, that blood trying to move backwards grabs the cusps of these valves and it slams them shut. In fact, that is the first heart sound you'll hear. You know, when you talk about the heart going love dub or thump thump, blood moving through the heart moves in laminar flow, streamlines. It doesn't make a lot of noise, you can't hear it easily. But when these valves shut, thump, thump, they vibrate the tissue a bit and you can hear it. So that first heart sound is the AV valve shutting. That's the love of the love dub, or the first thump, whatever you want to call it. So when the blood tries to go backwards, it catches that valve, slams it shut, and you hear the heart sound. Now the blood can't go out this way. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot of pressure in the ventricles. They generate a significant amount of pressure. So as we saw in the lab, there are little tendons, basically, strings that connect from the edge of these cusps down to projections of the ventricular muscle. These were called the papillary muscles. They're kind of like little guy wires. What they do is, because those valves are pretty big and they're very thin, the pressure in the ventricle would tend to blow them inside out like an umbrella in wind. You don't want that to happen because you die. So these chordae tendinae, as they're called, they kind of hold the edge of these cusps down, you know, like a, like the lines holding a tent so it doesn't blow away in the wind. It's that sort of thing. They also prevent this valve from bulging into the atria too much. That's referred to as pro prolapse. You always get a little prolapse if they're a little stretchy, but those chordae tendinae prevent these things from pushing too far into the atria. Again, that would reduce uh, the heart's pumping ability, or reduce efficiency. All right, so AV valve sh shouts, the tricuspid valve closes. Ventricles will continue to contract. And as the pressure builds up, blood's got to go somewhere. Well, we know there's another hole another opening into the ventricle. Attached to the right ventricle, the outlet tube, it's an artery, those blood vessels taking blood away from the heart, away from the ventricles, we call them arteries. Again, the blue-red jump, that doesn't mean anything because all of this blood on the models in lab, they'd be shaded blue, all these blood vessels, because it's deoxygenated blood. Doesn't mean artery vein, it means oxidated, deoxygenated. So blood coming into vena cava is deoxygenated. It's already been passed through the body once it's used, so to speak. It doesn't get oxygenated in the heart, so when it is pumped out these arteries, it's still deoxygenated. And of course, the large artery leaving the right ventricle is the pulmonary, or right on there, trunk. Big artery leaving the right side of the heart. So the ventricle will contract, it will eject blood squirt, out into the pulmonary trunk. As we'll see, that's going to make its way to the lungs. But then we know the ventricle can't contract forever. It squeezes on that blood as much as it can, but eventually it's going to stop. It goes back to diastole. Now, what's kind of cool, when the ventricle goes back to diastole, the pressure in here is going to be about zero millimeters of mercury. As we'll see in the arteries, it's not. You know, what is your blood pressure? 
Yes, Molly, absolutely right. Uh, about 120 over 80 is what they give you for a typical human blood pressure. What does that 120 over 80 mean? See that right up here somewhere? 120 over 80 is your clinical blood pressure. That's in millimeters of mercury. What that is, that's measuring two components of blood pressure. When the heart is contracting in systole, that's the 120. They call that the systolic pressure. When the heart relaxes and is no longer ejecting blood, that's what they call a diastolic pressure. What this pressure is really, if you watched it, your blood pressure would look something like this if you tracked it over time. Up, down, up, down, up, down. What we're measuring with clinical blood pressure, what is 120 over 80? Is that a division problem, a fraction? What does that mean? Those are the peaks and troughs of blood pressure. Clinically, and by the way, it's only in the brachial artery, blood pressure is at its highest, 120, during systole, that's the peak. It's at its lowest, these troughs here, is the 80 for the systemic system. It's gonna be a little different here, we'll talk about that in a bit. So you're basically measuring the peaks and the trough. What I want you to note is blood pressure in the arteries does not drop to zero. So in this artery, pulmonary trunk, there's not gonna be zero blood pressure. Blood pressure here is zero. Well, of course, blood's gonna try and go from high pressure to low pressure, so as soon as the heart relaxes, the ventral goes into diastole, this blood is at a higher pressure in the pulmonary trunk, the aorta, it's gonna try and go backwards. Again, you can have blood going from the ventricle, pulmonary trunk, back to the ventricle, pulmonary trunk, just be sliding back and forth. There's a set of valves here. We've looked at that as well. The valve between the pulmonary trunk and the right ventricle, you can call it the pulmonary valve. Or it's often called the pulmonary semilunar valve. They just look like little crescent moons kind of in there. Those little bag-like bits of memory. They don't have chordae tendae, no papillary muscles. So they're not as complex looking. But the ventricle will eject the blood in the pulmonary trunk. Then when the ventricle starts to relax, the blood will start to try and back flow. It will grab the cusps of those valves and dub. There's your second heart cell. So that love dub is dub, dub, close, 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 close. That's it for now on the right side of the heart. So I'm going to stop this one for the moment. And we'll come back in, talk a little bit more about these valves. And eventually we have to get to the other side of the heart. This is only half of it. Take care. Be back in a bit.